Okay, good evening, everybody, to uh, the people who are here. And that's okay. <laughs> people are here, people are online. Uh, let me just remind you that uh, we'll have a, a conversation uh, with the, with the, this three distinguished guests or insiders, I should say, uh, here. And uh, then we'll open up for question, obviously, uh, with both the people in the room and uh, uh, the people who are online who should use the Q and A uh, box to ask the question, the questions, and then I'll uh, refer them to uh, uh, report them to the to the speakers. Um, the great advantage of having three insiders, as I said, or three Johns Hopkins people here, is that uh, I don't have to introduce them to you because most of them uh, know them quite well, but. Uh, I'll do a quick recap from my extreme left is uh, Guido Sanleris uh, uh, of Argentina. Then there's Jackie Mazza uh, here from SICE Europe uh, and she's from the US, but uh, she's also our Latin American ex resident expert and uh, an expert on Mexico specifically. And uh, Felipe Campante who comes from uh, Washington and is, uh, is uh, Brazilian. Uh, I'll introduce very briefly the topic uh, and then I'll let them uh, talk to us and then we'll try and have as much time as for questions as, as we can. Well, why are we talking about Latin America? Latin America is the forgotten continent. So it goes, uh, the title of a famous book uh, that was written in 2007 by a veteran uh, Latin American editor of The Economist, Michael Reed, a good friend of mine. Uh, he wrote this book, The Forgotten Continent. And uh, as in the meantime, people uh, keep kept forgetting about Latin America in 2017, uh, he wrote another edition of the book and it was still called The Forgotten Con Continent. So uh, maybe things had not improved uh, uh, so much in the in the meantime, in the sense that the rest of the world really seemed to have uh, largely forgotten Latin America. And um, why they had forgotten Latin America? Not because Latin America was not interesting anymore, but uh, if in the 80s and 90s, the crises in Latin America were big crises, I actually used to go uh, a lot to Latin America at the time uh, in my previous life as correspondent, uh, foreign correspondent for an Italian financial newspaper. I was in Latin America a lot because there were crises in Mexico, in Argentina, in Brazil, in several other countries. Then, you know, the crisis came over here. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, they were a lot uh, bigger, at least we thought they were bigger and worse crises uh, in uh, both the US and Europe. Let me name just a few, the global financial crisis, here the Euro crisis, Brexit, uh, uh, now we have the war in Ukraine, uh, it was for the US, uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, Trump's election and all that. And so it's not that Argentina, all of a, uh, sorry, Latin America all of a sudden it's stabilized, but that, uh, you know, uh, maybe the rest of the world, at least the developed world uh, was so much more concerned with what was happening over here that, uh, uh, that, you know, that maybe we forgot that uh, Latin America also was in this state of kind of permanent, uh, uh, permanent crisis. Then we've had in rapid succession COVID, which is mentioned in the, in the title of our, uh, talk and now the, the war in Ukraine. And we'll see that, uh, how relevant they are for, for Latin America, even though, of course, in Europe, we tend to think them as very much European crisis, maybe the US COVID, maybe not so much Ukraine, but uh, they are very relevant for Latin America and also for the relationship between Latin America and, and the rest of the world. Now, to help us kind of frame uh, the issues, especially on the political side, um, and uh, see how the situation is evolving, there's a number of elections either coming or just happened in, in Latin America, I'll give the floor to uh, Jackie. Thank you very much. And thank you for welcoming 
top on the boiling pot of um, social discontent in Latin America. Um, we move through the lockdown period. The lockdown in Latin America was among the world's most uh, severe. Uh, and through that, we can look at pretty disproportionate effects that we're going to talk a lot about in this seminar, looking at negative effects on uh, growth, high rates of infection, high rates of uh, death. We'll talk about why that disproportionate impact was in Latin America, but I would start off by saying the high rate of informality made it much harder for the poor to lock down and not go out to uh, earn money, as well as we saw real weaknesses in the health systems, if we think about Peru, where they really were at a massive shortage of oxygen tanks to begin to see how difficult it was for the health systems to respond. But if we go and look at the political impact, the oddity would be that those uh, who had poor man COVID management might not have suffered as we would have thought they would suffer. And those who had relatively good COVID management <laughs> seem to suffer more politically than the reverse. And I'm gonna try and unpack that, why that's true. So first let's look at the poor COVID performance, but still hanging on to political popularity, our two poster children, really, ch presidents of uh, COVID management, Brazil's Bolsonaro and AMLO in Mexico. In Brazil, uh, you will probably know him as the uh, macho president who wouldn't wear a mask and gets COVID multiple times, he also very much delayed the arrival of uh, vaccines in Brazil. Brazil had some of the highest rates of death in the world, and uh, but he does spend higher than any of the other uh, big economies in Latin America on social uh, spending, almost up to 10% of GDP. But that is his principal uh, response. And now when we talk later about the upcoming presidential elections in uh, Brazil, at least the runoff in October, we are going to ask the question, is Bolsonaro really suffering from this poor COVID management? There were certainly protests during COVID, but now his popularity doesn't seem to be as dramatically affected. We switch to the other uh, scenario in Mexico, AMLO, again, did not, uh, was again, a, one of those presidents who wouldn't wear masks, got COVID three times. He was one of the few presidents who didn't try to cushion either the social impact or the economic impact on businesses. So he comes out of COVID in a better debt position than many of the other Latin American countries. But his uh, popularity remains about at 60%, uh, which is quite high. Uh, and as a result, he doesn't seem to have suffered much in popularity from the very poor management of COVID. On the other side, you know, two countries that followed this science, uh, we'll talk about Chile and Peru. In the case of Chile, at first, the health system did have trouble in its uh, attending to the medical crisis. But over time, Chile becomes the region's leader of vaccines. 95% of Chileans are currently vaccinated. But in uh, Chile's recent elections, they went with an outsider, Gabriel Boric, uh, on, the, on the left, basically calling into question uh, free trade in a country that often does not uh, have a free trade agenda. If we look at Peru, again, Peru took one of the most severe lockdowns at first, big suffering from the Peruvian uh, population in terms of highest per capita deaths, not only in the region, but in the world, also owing to poor, its poor health systems. And again, in Peru, we have a uh, no reward for at least trying to do the good thing. We, we have, again, an outsider, a teacher, 
uh, Pedro Castillo, who won the uh, uh, presidential election a year ago and is having quite difficulty running Peru and managing uh, to this day. So we also have the kind of poor COVID and economic performance, but increased uh, repression. If we look at Cuba, which had its first social protest since the 1959 revolution in uh, July of last year, both uh, Cuba and Nicaragua and Venezuela also had protests given economic conditions and they were um, brutally um, repressed. So if I come down to it, my key takeaway is to go back to UNDP's report, which said that the health crisis was also being accompanied by a crisis of governance in Latin America. I don't think I'd go that far to call it a crisis of governance, but we certainly have a weakening of uh, governance structures in two particular ways. One, we have the exacerbated social and economic inequalities in Latin America and a deepening distrust of government and political parties. We can see that politically in two different trends going on now in Latin America. One is the trend of the outsider. You play the outsider politically, even if you're the insider, like AMLO or uh, Bolsonaro, or you recast yourself as an outsider, as the recent uh, Costa Rican election, where the uh, winner was a former World Bank economist <laughs> and finance minister who uh, fashioned himself as an anti-establishment maverick. Or you play from the very far outside, which we would say was the case of Chile and Peru. We also have an accompanying anti-democratic uh, trend in the region, both for those countries trying to consolidate their power. If we look at Mexico, Brazil, El Salvador, <clears throat> as well as those who are cracking down more on the uh, opposition when we look at Venezuela and Nicaragua. So this political volatility and uncertainty doesn't uh, bode well in the future for good economic management. It will make it harder uh, for the region, but I'll leave it to my two colleagues and this panel to uh, further discuss how that will go. Thank you, Jackie. You gave us a pretty uh, clear, if not uh, totally optimistic <laughs> view of what's happening in Latin America on the political front. Uh, the, the pendulum seemed to have swung for, between populism, then very briefly to pragmatism, and then to populism again. To uh, take a look and give us an overview of uh, how things are going in the region uh, from an economic point of view, I'll give the floor to Guido Sandlerius. Thanks, Alessandro. Very interesting, Shaki, your analysis. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, quickly, I will try to review uh, the impact of COVID and the war in the region. Uh, I will focus, you know, Latin America is, is vast. I will focus on the six larger countries in the region, excluding Venezuela. So uh, when we look at what was happening pre-COVID, as, as Jackie said, the pattern was not homogeneous across the big six. If we look at Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, Chile, Colombia, and Peru, we see basically one group at the top in terms of growth, Chile, Colombia, and Peru, Mexico, uh, and I would argue Brazil in the middle, and Argentina underperforming. The only one being uh, that show in the last decade negative growth was Argentina. The recovery in the region, so COVID hits a region that was undergoing some uh, political uh, disruption and the decline in output was huge in 2020 associated with some of the longest and most strict uh, lockdowns in the world. Uh, however, the rebound 
in in economic activity last year was quite impressive for the region. When we look at the two years uh, together and compare output in 2021 with output in 2019, we see that Chile, Colombia, and Peru are already with levels of output above of what they had before COVID. Uh, Brazil also uh, marginally above, Argentina is likely below, Mexico is the underperformer in these two years. Uh, to, get, to get some perspective, if we look at the EU, for example, the level of output is still below where it was before the COVID pandemic. So one could argue that in these two years in terms of activity, most of the region of the large countries in the region did well. However, the increase in output came together as it happened with most of the countries in the world with an acceleration of inflation. The inflation levels in most of the countries, large countries in the region are at highs of a decade or two decades. Uh, Argentina, it's in a whole another. <laughs> I yeah, could have put it in the graph. It's off the scale. It's off it the was scale. Off we scale. can fit it in the graph. And, and I, I decided I have a special section on Argentina that we might discuss <laughs> later because the patterns and the kind of things that are happening there are slightly, some are, some have some points in common with what happens to the rest of the region, but some are specific. Uh, so this increase. In, in inflation uh, was the result of, of, of two things, basically. This, remember, happened before the impact that the war in Ukraine had on commodity prices. So this is prior to that. And it's more associated with a combination of, I would argue, two factors. One is the fiscal and monetary policy response to the COVID pandemic. And other, the other two, some disruptions in terms of uh, production chains. So some supply disruptions plus the strong uh, counter cyclical measures put in place. It's always very difficult to calibrate how much you should respond in terms of fiscal policy, in terms of monetary policy to a very unknown and different shock from all the others we had like the COVID. So inflation going up, and the, sorry, and, and, and what we see uh, since the beginning of, oh, sorry, since the end of last year is uh, central banks in the region in starting a hiking cycle, starting to unravel some of the stimulus they put together before. In terms of the fiscal response, this is this graph I think shows a pretty clear picture. You know? Like we have some of the largest fiscal primary deficit in decades in, for most countries in the region uh, in 2020. The exception to that uh, last year was Mexico. Mexico was the country that uh, put together the smallest fiscal package. Uh, it's not surprised then the underperformance that we describe at the beginning in terms of output. Uh, and most of the countries during last year did some form of uh, fiscal adjustment helped by the rebound in economic activity, of course, but still the fiscal deficits in the region in 2021 are much higher than what they were before the COVID pandemic. And even in 2022, they are larger than, and they are expected to be larger than what they were. Uh, as, as Jackie correctly said, it's becoming increasingly difficult to implement fiscal adjustments uh, in the region, given some degree of social unrest that we have observed. Of course, when you have fiscal deficit, the debt goes up, so debt to GDP ratios increase in the region, particularly for those countries that have more room to do it. Chile, Peru were countries that, hey, Colombia, where they have more fiscal space, more ability to borrow, and therefore could put together larger fiscal packages. One thing that when we look at the debt in the region, one thing that is a bit worrying is that now the world is facing 
uh, a hiking cycle by most developing developed countries. Uh, the US, the Federal Reserve in the US is expected to increase interest rates. The same happens with the ECB. And usually when this happens, the Latin America has suffered. That's the experience of the last decade. And the last time the Fed increased rates was in 2000, the last hiking cycle was in 2016. And the fiscal and debt space that the countries in the region had at that time was uh, more than what they have now. So they will have less ability to respond with fiscal or monetary policy at this point than what they had five, six years ago. So that's, I would say, some of the negative consequences of COVID in the region. And then on top of that, we have the war. The war, uh, of course, is a human catastrophe, but as we said, it's also an economic shock for the world, the war in Ukraine. The, and the impact on that, on Latin America, particularly on these big six countries, is not as bad as what we are seeing here in Europe for two reasons. One, they don't depend directly on uh, gas supply from Russia, for example. Two, and most importantly, because the war has generated a huge increase in commodity prices. And these six countries are important commodity producers and exporters. So for them, although they will have the negative shock of smaller uh, GDP growth in the world and the negative shock of uh, higher interest rates in the US and Europe, they will have a positive shock coming from the terms of trade for the, from the higher commodity prices that they export. Uh, so, that gives them some space uh, that might be helpful. Uh, so what comes next, and I'm gonna finish uh, with this slide, is in the region, on the one hand, we will have no doubt some further fiscal adjustment uh, with the limits imposed by, of course, social the social situation, some further monetary tightening because inflation is at record levels. Uh, and we will have some challenges, so challenging years ahead associated with how the region can handle this less benign environment in terms of financial conditions uh, that, is, that we are seeing uh, occurring. I'm gonna stop here and Alessandro, back to you. Thank you, Guido. Uh, you both pointed out how uh, Latin America is very diverse. So we, uh, it's a bit of a gross generalization to say Latin America this and Latin America that, because of course, uh, uh, different countries have different uh, uh, perspective and different reaction to uh, sometimes to the same, uh, same problem. And it's impossible not to, uh, uh, looking at the Latin American situation, not to look at some of the biggest country and the biggest, of course, is, is Brazil, which is not only influences the economies of uh, several of the neighboring countries, namely uh, Argentina in particular, but uh, all the others, and uh, is important in itself. It's one of the biggest economies in the world. Uh, and also, as it's already been mentioned, it has an election, a very important election, coming up uh, uh, in October. So uh, I'll give the floor to Philip to talk about Brazil. Great, thank you, Alessandro. Uh, thank you everyone for uh, coming here and uh, all of you attending as well. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. And as uh, I was thinking about the question of, okay, what are the prospects for, for the region more broadly um, and kind of using Brazil, I guess, to illustrate a little bit some of the issues here. Um, I'm, I'm definitely kind of uh, 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 drawn towards or weaving some of the themes that Jackie and, and Guido uh, presented uh, in that I think we really need to understand the interplay between the economics and the politics of the situation and sort of how the economic policy, both uh, 
kind of responds and conditions uh, 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 the political environment. And I think that basically lays the groundwork for, for what the, the next few years might look like. And in, in the context of Brazil, I would say <clears throat> there is a key source of, of uncertainty, if you will, for the next few years. And it's all sort of tied into the context of this election and in particular uh, the, 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 the prospects for, for Bolsonaro's uh, potential re-election. And I think partly uh, because of, of sort of what he represents in terms of the, the, the broader trends in terms of institutional uh, uh, weakening, I would say, and sort of the potential for, for further democratic backsliding. Uh, but also because I think, you know, everything sort of now uh, uh, is, is in a bit of a, a holding pattern in terms of trying to, to, to anticipate what's going to happen. And also because he, he brings about, I think, like a, a, a degree of uncertainty that goes beyond the pure electoral process and sort of brings in, uh, you know, in the way that he, he, he kind of has tried to challenge the credibility of, of, of the electoral process and so on and so forth. So I think a key question here is something that Jackie alluded, which is, okay, so what explains the resiliency of, of, of Bolsonaro as a, a political protest. And, and once we look at uh, uh, the, the data that is right there, that starts putting the puzzle into, into focus, right? So Brazil has had, uh, you know, had a terrible pandemic, uh, you know, 662,000 deaths at this point, which is the, the second largest uh, absolute number in the world. We should say that this is uh, uh, all, or this is partly about kind of the quality of data collection and so on. So, you know, uh, it's it's quite unclear that Brazil is actually the second highest number of deaths, but it's a massive, massive shock, right? And, and you know, as you can see, there's sort of the initial, uh, 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 you know, shock of the pandemic uh, in, you know, around April uh, 2020, then it kind of stabilizes at, at what looked like a very high uh, uh, um, uh, level at the time, then it goes down a little bit, and then Brazil gets hit by this enormous uh, uh, wave uh, about a year ago. And this is this is not the the Delta variant; it was kind of more of a homegrown variety here. So you basically see kind of a pattern where there is an an initial uptick, then like this massive massive boom. Now, if you want to look at what happens sort of on the economic side, and you know, getting to 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 Guido's point, you see a context where that. Has, a, has this massive uh, negative impact here. This is uh, 2020, 2021. Uh, um, so downturn in 2020, not that large, kind of related to the, to the and we're gonna get into this, uh, to the policy response and sort of this massive shock in 2021, then it picks up, but still kind of very much, uh, uh, as Guido pointed out, uh, two years of, 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 you know, at best, uh, you know, we're kind of recovering and barely so. So like rough, rough years. And that uh, added, uh, uh, you know, component of the highest inflation that we've had in quite a long time, not as high as in Argentina, but that's a different league, right? We're, we're, not, uh, we're not talking about the, the, the inflation pros there. So we're, this is very high by, uh, for Brazilian standards. Uh, and that's, that's something that, that is politically very fraught because Brazil does have a history of high inflation that, that has sort of traumatized the country at some level. So you would look at this and say like, you know, the guy who's presided over this, it's going to be like in, in deep political trouble right now. So how do we understand the fact that, uh, 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 as Jackie pointed out, he seems to be kind of not, he's not the favorite to win at this point. He's, uh, um, I might get into that, but but he still has a shot. And here's where, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting to look at the ups and downs of his approval ratings, which is what this uh, figure depicts, right? So as you can see, the, 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 the orange line is sort of the negative uh, uh, evaluations. Uh, the, the darker blue is the positive and the lighter blue is the you know, middle, uh, middle round. Now, what we see here, so this is 2020. So at the start of the pandemic, there is a huge spike or this what looked like a huge spike in the negative evaluation. But as the deaths kept accumulating, it falls sharply down. So what happened there? Well, what happened is that there was this massive fiscal intervention, the irony of which is that actually Bolsonaro was not really pushing for it. And it was a Congress that really pushed for, for kind of the size of the intervention that basically more than replaced the incomes of a, a very large number of residents. We're talking like sort of like 50 million people, right? Tens of millions of people who are getting this benefit, which speaks to, to sort of the, the degree of state capacity that Brazil has kind of being able to reach that many people. So what we see is that immediately as these payments, which were again, very large, so poverty actually fell in Brazil 
quite significantly during 2020. So there's a massive intervention and these numbers start going down, right? So it's tracking not so much COVID, but it's tracking that response, right? That fiscal intervention. Now, what you see is that then it plateaus or kind of uh, bottoms out in terms of the, the negative evaluation and starts rising again. Trying to know what happened. Was it that COVID got worse? Yes, but what happened is that they stopped the emergency support that happened uh, uh, at that point in time. So you see that it keeps tracking and going up up until the point where it plateaus. Why did it plateau? Well, because they reintroduced some measure, so it was not as large as it had been before. So as you can see, it's basically tracking that, that response, right? Now we get to 2022 and what we start picking up here is this uptick in the dark blue line, which is his approval rating. Again, what happened here, you will not be surprised to learn that there's been another degree of fiscal intervention here where now it's no longer the uh, emergency relief as it was called uh, uh, at the time, but it's this new sort of social uh, 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 program that Bolsonaro kind of implemented, basically dropping what sort of the, 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 the traditional and very successful sort of Bolsa Familia program and, and kind of rebranding it uh, uh, as his own program and actually increasing the value of quite substantially, not to the heights of the pandemic relief, but about two thirds of the way. So this is, this is substantial. Uh, so basically what we see here is that his approval ratings are tracking largely these fiscal interventions, right? So I think that's kind of a, 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 a very important thing to keep in mind. Now, in order to intervene in the way uh, uh, that has been the case, some of the fiscal rules that had been in place for Brazil, which, which had been suspended during the pandemic because you know, it was an emergency that was kind of uh, 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 you know, part of the rules to begin with, they were basically kind of scrapped, right? Not formally, but basically you know, like we're, we're gonna open so many holes that essentially like it scrapped those fiscal rules. So to Guido's point about kind of what the, the, the fiscal uh, prospect uh, uh, is going forward, it puts things in a position, not uh, kind of in a delicate position, not only in terms of the of the the accumulation uh, uh, of that that has been uh, 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 you know pursued uh, as part of this policy response, but in terms of the institutional aspect of it. Right. So what is the new? So what are going to be the rules going forward? Right. And I think right now we're in a bit of a, a of a kind of wait and see mode in terms of uh, 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 you know investors and so on and so forth. And what we see now is actually like to to, to Guido's point. So this is the behavior of the exchange rate in Brazil. And after like some, some uh, pretty strong depreciation, so going up here uh, means depreciation. So more uh, uh, Brazilian highs per, per dollar. So after a long period or you know, kind of a year of depreciation, then 2022 has started to see this appreciation of the currency and kind of more accelerating here towards the end because of the effect precisely of what Guido was mentioning, the, 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 the effect of the war and so on. So this is all kind of adding to context in which Bolsonaro is competitive because of sort of these uh, 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 responses and, and sort of what he uh, 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 and sort of the Brazilian political system, I think more broadly, the way uh, uh, it has responded. But it has done so in a way that I think magnifies the uncertainties going forward, both in terms of like the election uh, process, but also in terms of like what are the rules that are going to be in place and particularly like if, uh, you know, if Bolsonaro uh, uh, manages to, 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 to squeak a, a second term, you know, I think there's a question of, you know, what the institutional framework is going forward, but it also, even regardless of who wins and, you know, the alternative at this point uh, is probably, or it's certainly Lula, right? Kind of our old uh, uh, president. So the constraints I think in the rich, uh, uh, the next government are going to operate are, are quite important, right? And I think, this uh, uh, more broadly, I think, illustrates some of the, the broader themes that I think that happened in the region and in Brazil more broadly, because you may wonder, okay, so what, why is it that, you know, people are kind of, or, or, or sort of the, 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 the political preferences are, are tracking quite so closely? You might say, well, aren't people, are, are people kind of responding in, in too much of a short-termist way, maybe kind of not uh, anticipating the challenges? Uh, is that sort of uh, an indication of, uh, uh, myopia or irrationality. I think it's it's not quite something like that. I think it's more kind of a a, a, a broader, longer term uh, uh, feature of Latin America and Brazilian 
policy in that I think voters rationally, I would say, demand short-term gains uh, or short-term, uh, 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 um, you know, uh, provision of public goods, if you will, or, or, or resources, because they don't trust the political system to, to kind of deliver a, a kind of rational policy over the long run. So it's like, if, you know, like we need something now, like if we can get away with something now, like we go for it. So I think that's one uh, 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 long running pattern, but which is interacting, I think, with something that I think in Brazil, and I think uh, perhaps more broadly in Latin America is a little bit more recent, which is an increase in political polarization whereby, uh, uh, you know, what, you know, the reason why Bolsonaro's prospects are as, you know, uh, 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 good or not bad as they are, even though, as we can see here, he's still way underwater, right? This is something very, you know, it's not as if Bolsonaro is popular by any means, right? But the reason why he still has a shot under these conditions is because of political polarization, right? Because what he needs is not to be popular, he needs to be the one guy who is standing against those other guys so that enough people might say, okay, we'll go with him rather than with those other guys. And I think that bodes ill more generally in terms of policymaking because I think it breaks kind of the accountability mechanism that uh, democracy is supposed to provide so that, you know, when government performs poorly, and I think that gets back to what Jackie was mentioning, it's like, you know, the, this puzzle of underperforming governments not being punished, I think it's related to that. It's this idea that you can get away with uh, 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 underperformance as long as you can, uh, 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 you know, at least put yourself in a position to be that guy who is standing against those other guys uh, over there on the other side. And you can do that with, uh, 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 you know, the policy tools uh, uh, that you have available, even if in the long run, that uh, does not, uh, uh, you know, portend the optimal policy environment. So I'll, I'll leave it at that, and 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 you know, we can get back to some of these issues on discussion. But that that would be kind of my broad, my broad take on the situation. I'm going to do a quick second round, and uh, maybe I'll do it in reverse order and start with you. I'm not going to ask you to uh, predict the outcome of the election because I think at this point is pretty much impossible. But I think you've described the situation where you have. Uh, two populists in a way running against each other. Although, you know, Lula, when he was in government, at least for his first, certainly for his first term, and before he was replaced by his appointed successor, you know, he kept a pretty pragmatist uh, uh, agenda. But in a way, Bolsonaro, as you mentioned, stole his thunder or, you know, he's playing the same game with this, uh, you know, all the social spending or social subsidies and so much so that, you know, the traditional division, even regional division in Brazil, in the Northeast, where Lula is from and also is very, very popular. And that was the region that gave him his past victories. You know, now Bolsonaro is very popular in the Northeast because that's where the poor are. And these are the people who receive this. Uh, so I wonder, you know, with the outcome, regardless of the outcome of the election, we'll have a messed up situation on the economic front? Yeah, I think it's exactly right in the sense that I think like some of, or, or a lot of what's being done and has been done over recent years in terms of economic policies, generating costs that will constrain the next president, regardless of who that is, right? And I think so in that sense, it's, it's part of the standard uh, kind of policy cycle in Latin America where you have, you know, populist policies that eventually kind of uh, uh, end up constraining future governments and then you kind of start the cycle again depending on commodity prices and so on and so forth, which is kind of the, the other variable in the background, right? So if commodity prices are doing well, then all of a sudden you get you gain more room uh, uh, for doing it. So I think in, in, in that sense, uh, uh, the, the, political, the, sort of the, the economic policy prospects are quite constrained you know, unless there's like this, uh, like a bigger commodity wave that maybe, you know, uh, solves or quote unquote solves the situation. But I think it's, it's a, you know, the prospects for the next decade or so are of a relatively constrained uh, space for, uh, uh, for, for policy making. Now, where I think it becomes even more fraught is in the way that then it intersects and, and interacts with politics, right? Uh, 
because again, I think Brazil has witnessed uh, witnessed uh, 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 um, you know a, a remarkably a, a, a weakening of institutions, like in recent, like in in ways that I think are, are, are were quite surprising if we were looking at it from the standpoint of a decade ago or so, right? So now I think that opens the 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 scope of uh, the broadens the scope of political instability, right? So now the possibility of uh, you know, the kind of political turmoil that, you know, had previously, I think, uh, we thought it was, uh, we had overcome. And, and that basically feeds back into the policy uncertainty and creates the possibility, I think, of, of a very negative cycle, right, where the economic uncertainty and the economic constraints feed into the political instability, which then uh, uh, kind of feeds back into sort of the policy uncertainty and so on and so forth. So I would say, that is what I think is the main challenge uh, uh, for Brazil. Uh, and I would venture to say, I think in other places in the region as well, kind of going forward with all the, the, the you know, the necessary, uh, uh, you know, caveats. But I think we might end up in what can be a, a very negative cycle, which I think contrasts with where we thought we were, uh, I guess, you know, when the financial crisis hits, right? When we actually had uh, went through a period where, and I think that, you know, in Latin America more broadly, where policy had established the groundwork for, you know, having space for a policy response that you could imagine that then would lead into, and, and it looked like it might lead into a more virtuous cycle back then, which, uh, you know, didn't end up happening. But I think that's that's the main challenge that we face now. It's precisely the fact that, you know, these economic uh, 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 challenges and, 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 you know, contradictions uh, are creating a scenario where the interaction with the political uh, environment might actually take a turn for the worse. And that is my, my main concern for, for the next few years. Thank you, Felipe Guido. You promised to tell us about Argentina and we'd be remiss having here a former governor of the Central Bank of Argentina not to ask him about Argentina. So uh, Argentina is an outlier, but it's also a very, very interesting case. It just recently uh, concluded uh, the end agreement with the IMF. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's always interesting to look at. Uh, in Italy, there was a time where Argentina uh, used to generate a huge amount of interest, uh, not only because there are Many Argentinians, I mean, many Italians have relatives in Argentina, but also because a lot of Italians bought uh, Argentinian debt, uh, the famous tango bonds, and then Argentina defaulted on them, and a lot of people found themselves out of pocket. That uh, that interest is gone, but uh, but still, uh, the Argentinian case, I think it's it's very very interesting to look at. Yes, sometimes Argentina is like the region, but on steroids. No, everything happens. <laughs> to a larger extent, inflation and more severe crisis. Uh, so I, I have a couple of slides. The, the most important thing with Argentina, I think, is not to lose perspective of how poorly it has been doing in recent decades in terms of economics. Uh, of the last 40 years, Argentina spent basically half of those years in a recession in 25, of those years, inflation was higher than 20% every year since 2009. And something that is the usual thing for most countries in the world, which is not this year, but until last year, which is to grow and to have inflation below 5%. That's a normal year for most countries in the world. While Argentina had only five of those years in the last 40, okay? Uh, so, and the last one, was uh, more than a decade ago, almost two decades ago. So clearly there is something that is not working in Argentina that goes beyond uh, what any particular administration is doing. Uh, and I think that what is not working, the, the Achilles heel of what is not working, uh, and with this we move into the perspective now, is the fiscal part, okay? The Argentine government basically systematically spends more than what it collects as taxes. Uh, if we look at it, like 60 years of data, 
you see that in only six, we had overall fiscal surplus. And in 13, we had a primary budget surplus. Most, this means that most of the time, Argentina is financing its deficit either by printing money, so we have high periods of high inflation, or by borrowing, sometimes from domestic agents, sometimes from the rest of the world. The consequence of that is that all our crises are either, if it was a lot of money printing, ends up in higher inflation, even with hyperinflation periods. And if it has been a period of borrowing, the crisis ends up in a sovereign default that you want Alessandro was mentioning. Always, my advice to small investors is to invest in stuff you understand well. <laughs> uh, and, and the situation, one would say, well, this is the Achilles heel. The situation maybe how improved in, the, in recent years prior to the COVID. And I would argue that the opposite has happened, that the situation has become more difficult in terms of managing the macroeconomics of Argentina particularly because the size of government spending has almost doubled between 2003 and 2015. When you have populist administration in place and suddenly they have some uh, positive shock like Argentina had at the time was low world interest rate, high commodity prices. Basically the Kirchnerist administration between 2003, first Nestor Kirchner, then uh, his wife, Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner between 2007 and 2015, they increased government spending. And in doing so, they created this dynasty, but at the same time, they doubled the size of the public sector in Argentina. On average, government spending in terms of GDP for many, many years in Argentina was around 22, 23% of GDP. And from 2003 to 2015, it went up to 41 0.4% of GDP. That's an amount of spending that has to be financed. Part was done with higher taxes and part was deficit. We had a surplus at the beginning of that period. We ended up with large deficit and taxes have become so high compared to the services that the government provides in terms of public services that it has become like a backpack that is too heavy for the private sector to invest. So the economy doesn't grow, except when it has some random positive shock, then we have a couple of years of growth, but that goes away as soon as the shock disappears. Between 2015 and 2019, Mauricio Macri's administration, of which I was part, tried to correct this problem of, of excessive fiscal spending and, and government spending fell from 41 and a half percent of GDP to 35.8% of GDP. However, one thing that I can tell you from experience and there is large empirical evidence is that while increasing government spending tends to make you popular, cutting government spending makes you unpopular. <laughs> and that's why all this that Jackie was describing at the beginning, like, this idea that, well, there is some austerity intolerance. Well, it's, it's, it's true and, and it's difficult. So of course there were mistakes during those years in the way, years in the way it, it was done. But clearly this uh, trying to correct this problem uh, contributed to Mauritius Macri not being reelected and having the Kirchnerist uh, party, the, New Peronist party again in power since 2019. It took them less than a year to go back to the level of spending that we had before Macri's administration. Of course, the pandemic played a role there. Part of the increase was in terms of GDP was associated with the decline in output. But still today and even this year, uh, they are two, two and a half, three percentage points of GDP above in terms of government spending of where uh, Macri's administration left it. So basically half of the cutting expenditures is gone. So that's the, that's the, I would say the, the perspective I wanted to give in terms of what's going on in Argentina. And on that uh, scenario is on that background is that we had the pandemic where the economy contracted by 10% in 2020, but rebounded in 2021. 
almost reaching the same level of output in 2019. Uh, the response, as in other countries in the region, was through fiscal spending, but with a big difference, as the government had very little credibility, it couldn't borrow, and it had to finance all this increase in government spending with uh, monetary emission by the central bank. So the central bank finances, and we know what the consequence of this is. More inflation, and that's exactly what we had. Consequence one, inflation pick up. It is now uh, running, so last year was 50%, and now for this year, uh, so March data is gonna show a 6% increase month over month, not the year over year, month over month. Uh, probably for the year, it's gonna be 60, 70% inflation in that range. The second consequence is that we have a lot of capital controls because people uh, or investors don't want to hold that many pesos, Argentine pesos, and the government doesn't want to have the interest rate that would make those pesos attractive. It doesn't have the credibility to keep them there. So there are capital controls, and therefore there is a gap between the official and the parallel exchange rate. Having this huge uh, expansionary monetary policy imply that the gap between the official and the parallel exchange rate at some point was like 100%, now it's like around 80, 90%. And finally, and, and this is a very worrisome consequence, even probably more than the previous two, is that the central bank basically at the beginning of this year ran out of international reserves. And it's very difficult to keep the nominal stability of an economy when you don't have a central bank with some degree of freedom in terms of managing international research. So the situation was pretty difficult. Luckily for Argentina, the government reached an agreement with the IMF that helped to avoid the immediate default with the IMF and financial crisis scenario. This agreement basically is a bridge that allows the current administration, if they are able to meet the targets and, and the, the internal infighting between the different parts of the coalition in government doesn't derail the agreement. It would allow them to get to 2023, the year of the presidential election without a major crisis. But that's not obvious that that's gonna happen. This weekend there were a very, very loud rumors of a large part of the cabinet resign. The second positive thing is related to what I said, the IMF agreement gave international reserves to the starved central bank. Uh, seven billions of, of international reserves in net terms were given to, to Argentina right after the agreement. And so those were the two positive aspects of this agreement. And, and let me finish with what was the negative. The negative is basically that the IMF program, although it avoids the crisis, it postpones all the relevant structural reforms that Argentina has to make if it wants to go back to growth and to macro stability. Uh, a large part of the fiscal correction is postponed uh, until after 2023, that's for the next administration. No structural reforms were put in place. The government was very proud of this, which like saying, well, we are very proud that we are not making any structural reform. And, and this is pretty curious, no? Because if they were the government of Switzerland, economy grows, inflation is low, uh, it makes sense to think that the economy doesn't need structural reform. But clearly the Argentine economy does need structural reform. That's what we were discussing at the beginning, like a few minutes ago. So uh, we are gonna see two years of transition if we are lucky, we won't have another financial crisis. And then we, the burden of, of trying to put the economy back in track is gonna fall on the next administration. Thank you, Guido. Well, the good news, I just read that uh, you mentioned that you had uh, Nestor Kirchner and then uh, you had uh, Nestor Kirchner's wife. And then after the brief intermission of the Macri government, now you have the Kirchner's friend, and you know, one of the people who were rumored to be a candidate for next year's presidential election was the Kirchner's son. Uh, and the good news is that apparently uh, he's polling very badly. So uh, 
maybe we will not have the third member of the dynasty or fourth member of the dynasty in power after 2023, if things go right. Yes, but there are plenty of bad candidates. <laughs> <laughs> now we have our honorary Mexican here. Jack is a scholar of Mexico and uh, knows a lot uh, about it. And uh, she's already mentioned a few things about the situation there. I, I wanted to ask her because she's mentioned the, uh, the Lopez Obrador government, uh, which has been in power since 2018. And uh, just yesterday, I think they held this bizarre, okay. yeah. bizarre yeah. referendum uh, about, bizarre. you know, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the term is supposed to last six years. And after four years, you do a referendum asking people, you want me to Don't stay or not? <laughs> <laughs> you want me or not? So, a lot of strange things are happening in Mexico, and of course the situation is very different from the other two big countries because Mexico looks to the U.S. rather than elsewhere, and and uh, so I'm, I'm curious to hear your. At the same time, AMLO is undermining some independent uh, authorities like the central bank, the electoral commission, and so I'm curious to hear from you what what's going on in Mexico. Well, I uh, can't answer all of that. Um, I am reminded by Octavio Paz's uh, phrase that um, those who say they understand Mexico don't understand Mexico. Um, and I think that um, no matter how often you look at Mexico, even if you're Mexican, they you still quite don't understand it. But, apply to Italy as well. Yes. <laughs> or Argentina <laughs> politics. <laughs> But I just wanted to add, I think really Guido had given you the two, you know, big takeaways economically for Mexico, which is, is that they came out of uh, 2020 in the best fiscal position because they didn't uh, spend uh, heavily. But they also meant they that businesses and income fell more dramatically in Mexico in 2020 than the rest of the region. Uh, Mexico had an economic contraction of 8.5% in 2020, which I believe is the largest in the region. But um, coming back pretty healthily in 2021, um, but some of that is due exactly to what Alessandro uh, alluded to. That is uh, some of Mexico's improvements its exports to the United States in 2021 are the same level that they were in 2019, which is owing to the US economy more than the Mexican economy. The uh, other thing that's really um, uh, remarkable, and I'll, I'll just put, you can see that the economic policies pursued by AMLO really have more to do with its political um, a positioning for AMLO and his uh, Morena party, somewhat akin to what um, Felipe was saying on Brazil. So right now, we would have hoped that Mexico would have been in the lead for that, you know, um, near sourcing, um, that is the improvement of supply chains and manufacturing because of its relationship with the United States. And the truth is the policies pursued by AMLO are not attracting the kind of foreign investment that one would have expected in this sort of post environment. One is that AMLO has focused on what he calls electricity reform, but it isn't reform, it's the unraveling of the private uh, ownership of electricity and rolling it back to more public ownership. He has not been able to get that through the Congress because he doesn't have a two thirds majority there. But that's a little bit behind the theater that of the recall election. That is, he is still attempting to demonstrate that he's the only uh, game in town. Usually um, in this part of the Mexican political cycle, if you're in your last two years, that's often you know, considered the uh, dead weight. 
But um, not only is AMLO alluding to maybe you don't want me to go um, and not actually yet naming who would be his successor in the Morena party, but for sure he is setting Morena up to be uh, the winner in uh, 2024. And he's doing that exactly as Alessandro had mentioned by undermining the uh, federal uh, electoral institute, which is for sure the linchpin of uh, Mexico's democratic movement. That is the um, integrity of the electoral system he is trying to undermine. For his referendum, he cut the uh, uh, electoral institute's budget by a half and then complained, well, the reason I got such poor turnout at my recall election is because they are all against me in the electoral uh, institute. Uh, with this recall election, what he attempted to do was again saying, do you want me to stay or uh, I will accept your decision if you want me to go. Of course, it was the Morena party who put the petition up for the recall election. That is, it was an opposition to um, AMLO. And as a result, it was a very low turnout, 18%, but uh, he won that 18% and 90 uh, with 90 percent of the vote. So he is using it both to try and position the improvement in the governor's races in June, that is for his Moreno party to move them up, particularly uh, to be able to get through his electricity uh, reform and set the uh, country up for a much less uh, democratic future. Well, thank you very much. You've also put up some slides that will broaden our focus again to uh, uh, the region rather than individual countries. And so far, we've looked at, uh, uh, you know, one, two, three years prospects for both uh, the politics and the, and the economy. But I think it's right that we look at some longer term and structural issues for the, for the region like education, poverty, and inequality. So if you want. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I just want to um, do a Yeah, thanks. Um, here, um, when we look at the long-term impact of the uh, of COVID in Latin America, Latin America with this graph is the um, region with the longest school closures. You'll see it's over 37 uh, weeks. This is up till, I think it was up till uh, March of 2021. What the research has shown at the moment is that a month of school closures has turned into a month of lost learning. And this could be, at least UNESCO calls it a catastrophic impact on uh, human capital development, and this is through the world, but Latin America in particular, one, because of its high rate of school closures, also because the um, poor and low income populations were the least able to go online, and they were the most out of, um, at, that is the most time out of school. The other issue, it's not just learning and school closures. I just wanted to add, it's also about what we're seeing in terms of increasing dropout rates. So the only data we have now is for Brazil and a survey, the 10 to 15 year olds, which is the, exactly the age you don't want to drop out of school. Right now, 10% are saying they won't go back to school. Uh, so that is, we are increasing what has already been a dropout problem in Latin America, and that bodes poorly for the labor market in Latin America. And what we have in Latin America that isn't true of many other developing regions is an increasing older age. That is, the, a smaller labor force has to support a larger uh, aging population, particularly without good pension systems. So as a result, we are not, in essence, enabling a, uh, wage, a higher wage earning labor force. And this is what I would worry most about for Latin America.
Thank you, Jackie. I would like to uh, open it up for question. I will uh, remind you the participants online that they can use the Q&A box. And in the meantime, if there are some questions in the room, uh, please raise your hands and tell us your name and your yeah, hello. country of origin. If you don't, I think so. Uh, my name is Martin. I, I come from Peru and I'm a student of both Professor Mata and San Luis. Uh, my question is, I mean, if we think about COVID as an interesting comparative case, uh, whereby we get the chance to not only compare how countries react to COVID, but also what the diagnostics are. It seems to me interesting, the diagnostic of the underlying issues are, it seems interesting that in Latin America, a lot of the talk, at least in, in, in the newspapers, were that Latin America needs a new social contract. Uh, apparently it was so, the, 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 the underlying issues in Latin America were so deep that um, then there was a need for, for a new social contract, this sense that neither the government is delivering. And as a reaction to that, uh, the citizens are um, unhappy so much that, that they will react politically. Um, quoting here from an article that said, the region's healthcare and social protection schemes are fragmented and unequal. Its economies have stagnated for the past six years. Citizens are angry. People sense that Latin American democracies can, cannot carry on like this. So my question to you is, do you think, first of all, th that it is useful to think of the issues of Latin America as an issue with a social contract, that there is just a broken link between the government and the citizens? And following up from that, do you see the, the health of democracies in Latin America endangered by, by COVID, really, and, and, and ever, all the issues that, that it has kind of revealed? Thank you. Let's take that. I'll, I'll start. Um, again. Um, I'll start with that. And I think the concept of a new social contract is often a misnomer for this somehow this idea that there isn't enough uh, discussion from civil society and the lower ends. The truth is that um, the region had going into um, 2019 made very good progress on reducing poverty, particularly on reducing extreme poverty. But its political structures was still highly unequal. And as a result, the um, sense that those elites in power would make certain decisions that impact already negatively those who have been on the lower end. What we've talked about in uh, Latin America is that inequality is high, not because the poor are so relatively poor to, some, to Africa or South Asia, but that the rich are so comparatively rich. And I think the issue with the new social contract is the part at the top. <laughs> that is that without a recognition by Latin American elites that the perceptions and the underlying inequality has to be addressed. A new social contract will just be another way to paper over the fundamental um, workings of this. And so now I think uh, Felipe's point was, you try to say, I'm not like all the other political parties. I'm not even if you are, even if you are as corrupt. Or, so I think what we really need is a different consensus among the elite that this, you know, that they will just get this cycle of social protest unless we more fundamentally face the differences. If I may add to this, I think it's interesting to, to uh, Martin kind of bring this in the context of COVID and, and at some level COVID is almost like the the political dog that hasn't barked that much. Actually, getting to the, the to Jackie's point earlier on, I mean, I think the health of democracy in many countries in the region, Brazil very much included, is poor and declining. But it started before COVID, right? So if you, you think about Brazil or Mexico, right? Amlo was elected before COVID. Bolsonaro was elected before COVID. The the Estadio in Chile happened before COVID. So like all these fraying uh, or sort of these fault lines were were there and it's almost as if like covid uh, 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 you know certainly didn't help but it's it, it hasn't reframed things in a way that maybe like you might have expected like if you look at just the impact that it had not only in terms of like the death toll itself but also when you think about policy failures like the the education crisis and and, and all the rest of it 
So in some sense, it's almost like it, it kind of shows how deep the, 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 the roots of the crisis are, because it's really not been, uh, uh, sorry, it's really not been about COVID all that much, right? So in that sense, the fact that it, uh, 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 you know, COVID hasn't had its impact felt as much as you might have thought, and at the same time, you know, the decline, I think, uh, keeps, uh, you know, going further and further in, in my estimation. I think it, it illustrates that it, it, you know, the solution, it's going to be hard as well, right? Because it's not kind of a transitory shock or, or something like that. I think it, it, it speaks to deeper fault lines in these, in these societies. And yeah. Yeah, and, and doesn't seem to be, uh, at least going back to what Jackie was saying, at least in Brazil, which is a situation I know better than others, any recognition from the elites that they should be tackled. Yeah, yeah, and I think, uh, uh, um, and, you know, mask fell off here, but uh, just go on. <laughs> My mask fell off. Uh, 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 I think it, there is... At some level, I think the the like a failure to to recognize the depth of the crisis, right? So it, it surprises me a little bit uh, the, the extent to which it, it sort of feels like business as usual, kind of in an. Uh, I think it's certainly true in Brazil. The refrain is like, "Oh, the 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 institutions are working, right?" And it's like you know things keep <laughs> going down the hill, and, and it's like, "No, no," but like still, like you know, things are still. And and even like I think that the the temptation even like from the opposition has been to try and kind of return to or offer a return to like yesteryear, and I think it's just not going to be enough. And I think that that adds to my my uh, concern or 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 my my fear that the next few years are going to be very fraught. Precisely because I agree with you that there hasn't been this. Uh, uh, reckoning that the, the problem is deep. Yeah. I had something to add. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So, when I think your question is very interesting, Martin. So, you, you got us three for thinking about it. I, I was trying to think a little bit in perspective about the region and, and the issue of the social contract. Forget whether it's the right thing or not. I'm, I'm sympathetic with your view on that, but just to take it from your question. So, a couple of things in favor. I think that like a couple of decades ago, we saw in the region kind of a new social contract. Now we have a region that for the last decades and still today has no serious hypothesis of wars in the region. There are, it's already 40 years of democracies after many years of, of military government. Let me leave aside, of course, Venezuela and, and Cuba there. Uh, Poverty reduction, uh, it has been mentioned, has been impressive in these decades. And this has come together with a number of economic reforms, much better uh, institutions almost everywhere. Argentina may be a lager there. Uh, and I agree with, with Felipe that now we have challenging economic times ahead. But I think that this consensus is, is there to stay within the Peruvian economy, your country, like huge political instability in recent years. And nonetheless, we still have Julio Valverde as governor of the central banks, of the central bank, inflation being low, the economy uh, growing. Of course, we could do better. Latin America's region is a laggard in terms of growth in, in recent decades. Uh, and the COVID crisis hit us in a moment in which I think there were many reasons for the social unrest, but one was uh, a certain lack of social mobility. It was not only inequality, the problem. I think it's a combination of inequality and the perception that your kids are not gonna be better off or are not gonna be able to climb the social ladder. Uh, so, and, and when we had those like social unrest associated to that, we are hit with the COVID and higher world leaders, right? All what we were discussing. So it's gonna be challenging, particularly because we are seeing some patterns that are not just in the region, but in the world, which is a resurgence of populism. You know, and countries that I think fare better on that regard are those that have more solid institutions. If your institutions are weaker, then populists have much more space to do, to pursue responsible policies. Uh, I think that some countries in the region are gonna go through these challenging times and emerge uh, stronger. And other ones 
are going to have a harder time. Some are the obvious suspects. Mike. Just a, a quick question. Uh, Jackie mentioned that the problem uh, has to do with uh, real wages. And we've heard some, we've seen some really interesting data on sort of short term macroeconomic policy and indicators, but you haven't said anything about productivity and the productivity challenges facing Latin America. And I wonder if you could sort of, if anybody wants to pick that up to say what these trends are and um, if they're as bad as they are in Italy. I'd love to start with that because that is the heart of Latin America's long-term economic challenge, the fact that labor productivity has stagnated. So largely, we have a lot of reasons for it, but largely because almost all the employment growth is in the small and medium sectors, and we have such high informality in many countries. So that is, we have the survival of not very competitive uh, firms. And so I think the um, what Latin America has that's quite different than Southeast Asia is the disconnect between the wage expectations of the uh, population and where they are. They are a middle, mostly middle income countries, yet they don't have the human capital base to in essence grow uh, in terms of higher uh, productivity. And Average wages are actually a mixed bag, even under COVID, because of the uh, inflationary impact. So we have real wages increasing in some countries and not uh, in others. The real worry for the in for inflation is that you are going to eat away at any uh, wage increases right on the population that. Uh, is kind of most susceptible to, um, they're right at the margin. And I kind of wanted to go back just for a second on Martine's question, because you really got us thinking. So what would I say is at, at the heart of that elite, the elite new contract with Latin America? First, I would say we've talked about it for 40 years, is tax reform. You know, Latin America has a, you know, a, value added tax they have some of the lowest personal income tax revenues italy again of uh and as a result the we we keep getting fiscal uh, increases from debt rather than a restructuring of the uh financing of institutions we also and we talked about this in our labor markets class we have the severe problem of the spending on education. So the problem with Latin America is not that it doesn't spend enough on education. It spends as much as an OECD country does, but it spends almost the large part of that on university subsidies for the rich. The rich are going to private school. They also were the ones who didn't suffer as much during COVID because they were in private education. So as a result, when we talk about uh, restructuring uh, or educational reform, we've talked about it for years in Latin America. And one of it is qualified teachers We've been able to, uh, we haven't been able to even get teacher standards in uh, Latin America. <laughs> Having them get a high school diploma as a, you know, as a criteria for being a teacher in, in key countries. So I think we have some really fundamental ways that the poor see themselves as disadvantaged that are more structural then the inequality figures and the improvements. So when you've got improvements in poverty and extreme poverty, the poor still saw that the system was stacked against them. Uh, going back to Guido's point about social mobility, I can't move forward, both the way the economy is structured and the way uh, that, I, that I can, uh, in essence, increase my human capital. Yeah. And speaking briefly to Mike's point, I think what I find disheartening about the current situation in Latin America is it seemed that after the decades, as Guido mentioned, uh, of a sort of progress, both in terms of economic policy and sort of institutional consolidation, it felt as if we had graduated, not in every country, uh, but to a point where we're sort of 
talking about this type of issue, right? It's like, how do we increase productivity, right? How do we face the challenges of sort of long-term economic growth? It's like, we, we had moved to the realm of economic growth models. And now it feels as if we're kind of back a little bit. We're sort of discussing a little sort of more, you know, okay, what's next year going to be like? I mean, it felt as if like we were in a more normal environment where the policy questions were more of a type, okay, how do we increase productivity? And now we're back to like, how do we maintain the sustainability of, you know, fiscal policy, right? I mean, some, some countries hadn't reach that point and not to pick on Argentina and obviously like Venezuela is a completely different case, but that's what I feel like where we've moved back a bit. And, and that, again, I think the institutional instability kind of move us, moves us back in terms of economic policy making as well, because it kind of brings to the table, you know, uh, 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 you know, outcomes that I, we thought they would have moved past. And, and all of a sudden, you know, we start discussing, those things and, 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 and as opposed to kind of those more fundamental things like, you know, how do we increase productivity and, you know, which has to do with education and, you know, institutions and so on. So that's, that's kind of depressing. Well, just two seconds. So yes, I agree. <laughs> we, <laughs> we don't know. And I think that your, your question is super important Mike, because as Philippe was saying, uh, most of the world, when often they talk about economic issues, they talk about how to improve productivity. You know? They talk about education. They talk about policies for entrepreneurship, innovation. And, and the region has moved in that direction in these decades. And now we are seeing in the region and to some extent in the world that macroeconomics is back you know, in the economic debate due to inflation uh, in 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 the world, and to some extent, some like, worse fiscal situation and, and so on. So I think that for the region, it's key to keep on like the stable macroeconomic policies that most of the countries achieve in recent decades and keep on discussing this issue, productivity. I think we have a question over here and another one on the other side. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Sofia. Uh, my question is about kind of sparked from Martin's question about the impact of a like social contract and challenges to democracy, but I think also an interest in democracy in the region from citizens who are, you know, participating in more and more social movements, maybe. Um, I'm curious to know what your thoughts are on how recent uh, increases in feminist movements in the region might have to do with some of this um, topics that we're discussing. And I take advantage of the fact that there's someone from both Argentina and also Mexico on the panel because these are big parts of it, right? And also I think Chile and the new um, constitution and the, you know, Gabriel Boric. So I'm curious to know your thoughts on how that may interplay with some of the topics we were discussing. Thank you. We will take the other one here on this side. Uh, hi, my name is Irene. I'm from California. Um, I had a question, probably more so for Professor Sandlers, about the fiscal aid that was given. Would you say that it was more effective in Latin America in terms of targeting those who were affected by the pandemic rather than, I mean, for example, in Latin America, it, was, it seemed to me more targeted towards uh, lower income, family, unemployment, versus in the US, it was much more blanket aid. And in Europe, targeted towards protecting employment and through, um, yes, through the employment channel. So would you say that was more effective? And also bring up what Professor Matz has referred to as the problem of uh, informality of the labor sector. Was that taken into account in any way in these fiscal policies? Or um, despite seeing poverty decreasing in some ways, is there not necessarily a translation into reduction of inequality when a good amount of the population is informal and not affected by these fiscal aids. And uh, uh, take uh, Sophia's question, sorry. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, that type of uh, um, sort of political dynamic where you see sort of these social movements uh, emerging and, and, and sort of gaining uh, strength in the political spectrum, I think that really underscores uh, 
why we need kind of a healthy institutional environment to kind of process this type of uh, uh, you know demand that that also because I think and I think here the example of Chile uh, 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 and I'm thinking of the example of Brazil as you know kind of different paths uh, uh, in some sense right I think Chile kind of this thing kind of came to 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 a, a, um, a head and and you know seemed to be uh, driving like quite a bit of political instability but I think the later indications have been that the political system has been able to kind of process this or you know at least there's that path in, in a way that I think it's healthier right so you have an, a, an election that was deeply polarized right but in the end you have you know kind of a, a left candidate and a, a right candidate but you know the losing candidate accept the results uh, you know like there is a constitutional process going on that you know may or may not be approved by voters but but seems to be you know, process through this political system. And that I think is a healthier way of processing the polarization that, you know, those uh, movements also reflect because these are deeply conservative or these societies with deeply conservative segments as well, right? And, 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 and I think, again, being able to process this within the democratic, uh, the context of the democratic institutions is the main challenge. And, and I think some countries, I think, are giving more positive signs, and and it was not clear that it that it would go this way. But I think it's is it's turning out a little more positive. But others, maybe not so much. And I, and I'm afraid Brazil might be in that. And and then you kind of end up in that cycle of polarization that disrupts democratic accountability and and the whole thing. Uh, you know. But I think it's it's a very important aspect of of that. You know, of those societal forces and the importance of institutions to process them in a, in a healthy way. Yeah, I wanted to first start with your, and it's a really interesting question, Sophia, because you almost have to um, analyze what we might see as legitimate social movements that achieve um, their objectives, which was the uh, pressure on the change for the Chilean constitution. And as um, Felipe is saying, did resolve itself in a way, uh, they finally got rid of the Pinochet uh, constitutional elements. The problem is that there's so much pent up need for reform in so many places that, that in essence, they didn't get a whole lot of credit for the constitutional change, which was necessary. But, um, what we have is that kind of inspirational spark now is for agendas at the margin. I was just listening to news from Peru this morning and four days ago, Peru had a protest about rising gas prices. Pedro Castillo um, inaugurates a 24 hour lockdown, which creates a bigger social protest as soon as he comes out. And now they think they're going to call for the third impeachment of Pedro Castillo. So here, that that is it. It's a social movement that has many different problems, and the question is, can we channel it to contribute uh, substantially to all of the evolution of these changes? It's needed to, or does it become? Uh, too much of a fire to a match, and in essence, the you know the pushback is worse than um, than the uh, than anything uh, that we can see at this point. In Mexico, Amlo is an example of someone who talks the social movement. You know, the whole referendum was the social. The people are speaking. Not really. <laughs> this was not an example of the people speaking. Um, but he did say it that way. And so we, we had to be careful in Latin America. The misappropriation of social movements is really easy to do. Yeah, the Irene. Ah, yes. Uh, so just what, one word or two words on your question, Sophia. I think it's a fantastic phenomenon, the uh, women movement, uh, feminism. And particularly, I, I'm going to, so it has many dimensions. I'm going to focus on the economic part. Labor force participation by women in the region was relatively low. So this was, from an economic point of view, I'm, I'm kind of 
needed in this analysis, but it's an untapped human resource for the region that could generate huge growth. Uh, and linking it to my question, it can generate huge increases in productivity as well. So I think it's a more than welcome phenomenon. Uh, that was clearly not the result, at least in most countries of government, intervention of policies was more like kind of brewing for many years and, and appear in full force. So, so fantastic thing. Going to your question, Eileen, whether the aid was more effective than in the US and Europe, uh, I think it was relatively effective in, in, in most parts of the world. Now, what, when, when you look at the rebound, I'm measuring two things, the rebound in economic activity following COVID, following COVID the fact that poverty didn't increase as much as it was feared. Uh, uh, talks about uh, programs that were, at least in the region, well-focused, uh, relatively well-focused, that's important. It's hard for me to compare and tell you well, if through the US made like more across the board thing, but it had more resources. Uh, the consequences is some of the money inflation that we are seeing now. Uh, in terms of the second part, whether, so, so I'm not sure I understood, was whether informality was taken into account in this aid or as a marginal phenomenon? Yes, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes, they did. Yes, yes, they, they managed, most countries in the region managed to get aid to formal and informal workers. Yes. Just want to um, uh, compliment what uh, Guido has said, both on the uh, women's labor force participation. First, it is true that um, women's labor force participation is the biggest explanation of the increasing growth of Latin America in the 1990s. Under COVID, however, there is a disproportionate loss in women's labor force participation. It's still relatively low. It is now about at 50%, you no, know, it's high in Colombia, it's low in Mexico, but it is 75% for men. That is men regained more labor force participation on uh, post COVID than uh, did women. And the issue as well is poverty by women's head, head of households as a consequence also uh, increased relative uh, to male working age poverty. So we have, setbacks from the uh, from COVID that are going to require additional, you know, policy tools to move forward. But it certainly is true that the next stage of uh, Latin America's development is to move up that women's labor force participation, because now in many countries, they are more educated than men. So that is that is part of the human capital base that they need to draw on. I just wanted to go to um, Irene's question because uh, um, what we found because Latin America had these conditional cash transfer programs in place, uh, informal workers could get increases uh, in their cash transfer programs from the um, uh, during COVID. That is, most countries. Uh, nothing like Brazil, but most countries increase their cash transfer program, and that's irrespective of labor force status. A country like Peru, which had done a real reform of its civil registry, has the best civil registry, I would argue, in all of Latin America, really could target the newly poor because it had such good data on where people were. The problem for uh, uh, Brazil and other countries was identifying the newly poor who were informal workers. And that lockdown got, uh, that, that part is difficult, just depends on how well the country could identify uh, who to get that tra cash transfer to. But their administration was really poor. It's still often long lines, <laughs> waiting on a long line during COVID for your cash transfer has a lot of uh, problems. Africa was better on cellular phone uh, transmission. But there, I think that informality um, 
vis-a-vis the United States. The United States is the outlier with largely using unemployment insurance as its COVID instrument, which means layoffs. Uh, Latin America in the formal sector, which was small, largely used unemployment insurance in uh, the Southern Cone, wage subsidies in other mechanisms, but these were all form instruments for formal workers. So in, in essence, the better instruments were for the formal workers and the informal workers were in essence relegated to the cash transfers. Well, I think we've already, we have one last question because I think we've already exceeded the time allotted to us, but there's a reason. And, and uh, yeah, okay, Mike wants to come back. Okay. Um, hi, Please. I'm Camille, I'm from the US and I'm a student at Plan for Estes and Ladies. Uh, I have two questions, but I'll try to make The first one has to do with uh, migration. So, uh, America, a and I know for, a lot of UN agencies, there's uh, the hot topic right now is remittances and how to use remittances as a tool for economic development or economic growth in the region. And I would love to hear um, from people actually from the region if that's on the radar of politicians or development organizations there themselves. And my second question has to do with um, the Ukrainian war. Uh, when it comes to uh, sanctions placed by the US, there's talks of uh, opening the relationship with Venezuela and as we've seen that Venezuela and Cuba are you know the outliers together do you think this will change um, their standing in the region and how so so thank you right <laughs> uh, quickly on the on on that last one I think not really I think uh, it, it's not going to make much of it I mean if, if anything it might actually help uh, uh, Venezuelan government, uh, you know, survive is not, you know, so I, I don't think that that would be kind of a necessarily a positive aspect there. Uh, I would say though that, that the crisis actually highlights and the fact that I think most countries haven't joined in sanctions and, and, and whatnot, I think it actually highlights the role of China and, and how it, it is a big influence in the region right now, but that's, I guess, a topic for, for, for a different, for a different moment. Yeah. I would just add um, the you know the record uh, remittances uh, in 2021 to Mexico and Central America were very uh, important to their uh, economic development, but people are seeing it more as a cash transfer, uh, not as an uh, investment like. You uh, are aware that IFAD is uh, looking towards uh, in terms of rebranding or repurposing um, these remittances towards investment. The region has only one really uh, poor program, a Mexican tres por uno. They would, you know, if the uh, they would match remittances uh, for uh, economic development, and it led to the richer. Uh, the richer parts of Mexico were the uh, remittance receiving uh, countries, uh, remittance receiving regions. And as a result, it was a disequilibrium. That is the most needy states were not in essence getting the advantage of the uh, tres por uno. Thank you. You mentioned China, and that's a big elephant in the room, of course, in the, at the very end, because of course it's very important in the region, and also it may alter the the term of trade question because, of course, commodities are surging. But last time commodities were surging, China was also opening up to the world, and he actually was the the big you know market outlet for a lot of Brazilian and Argentinian export. This time, China is in lockdown. So we don't know what will happen there. So the equation may change slightly. I think Mike, as the host, wanted to have the final word. You... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll let you, on that note, we'll, we'll let you all go to uh, dinner. Thank you, Felipe, Jackie, and, thank you. and Guido. It was very interesting. Thank you.